It's Wednesday, September 20th, 2023, episode 12 of the Market Huddle Plus. I'm Patrick Serezna. This week, we have the pleasure of welcoming to the show one of my favorite chartists, Pinecone Macros, Chase Taylor. We'll take a look at the charts on commodities like cotton, sugar, and copper, as well as the charts on cannabis, home builders, and Bitcoin. Quick disclaimer, nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding the topics mentioned on the show. Side effects of too much market huddle may include boxed wine motor malfunction, long duration fed phobia, and anaphylactic prairie dog shock. Let's get Chase on the call. So I'm so excited to bring back one of my favorite chartists, uh, Pine Cones, Chase Taylor. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. How are you, Patrick? I'm doing great. Listen, uh, I love to bring you on to talk some charts, and uh, I can't think of a more interesting time to just kind of explore what you're thinking here. And we are, we're recording this uh, still before the FOMC release on Wednesday, and so we haven't seen the reactions to it. Uh, I was thinking the market was going to settle in here a little bit uh, before the FOMC, but uh, here we're down 34 points uh, on on the Tuesday. Uh, what's your what's your thinking? Is this already some sort of a leg? lower or do you think we're gonna um whip around here how are you thinking about the s&p here i i would i kind of lean towards whip around i think it's time to head lower but i'm i kind of assume we'll have our normal post fomc vol crush and vol control people will come back to buying late in the week things like that so i would not be surprised if we kind of have a reversal you know towards the end of the day tomorrow and do okay the rest of the week but in general i think it's time to head lower and and mostly because the, the same thing that made the market, in my opinion, go up most of the year is going to make it go down. And that's just mostly oil dollar rates. As long as oil, the dollar and rates are going to move higher, then it's really, really difficult for the market to move to, to move higher. Uh, you, you think about the dollar, j- just just the dollar, forget the, the rest of the stuff with uh, overseas uh, profits. You know, that that's 40 percent of the S&P earnings is overseas, 58, I think, for for tech and all we've had lead this whole thing is tech. So time to roll over, I think, but I could see end of week having a decent run. So right now, um, the CME futures are basically 99% at the Fed. It keeps rates unchanged here tomorrow, but uh, it's increasingly uh, kind of a, a wa- uh, toss up for that November meeting. Uh, right now, uh, they're showing a 70% they keep things unchanged and a 30% chance that uh, there's going to be a rate hike in, in uh, November. Uh, what's your thinking on rates? You think uh, the Fed is done or uh, is there one more rate? A hike to come. I, I mean, I think they definitely want to be done, but we're obviously in this situation, this kind of area where inflation is reaccelerating, mostly just because of uh, because of energy prices. They should be smart enough to look through that and not hike. But yeah. I, I'm not 100 percent convinced they will be smart enough. So I think that 70 30 split, 60 40, something like that's about right. A um, lot of data between now and November, so we'll see. Yeah. What I find fascinating, though, we'll just touch on this before we get to some of the charts you wanted to talk about, was simply the fact that uh, from a seasonality perspective, March and October are the two most volatile months of the year. And uh, here we have the S&P kind of topping out and getting heavy along the top side. But volatility is basically at multi-year lows. I mean, fine, we're off of the uh, 12 handle on the VIX, but still very low vol premium. It doesn't seem like anybody's grabbing at premium and, and getting nervous about these markets. Uh, what's your take on the fact that we have such low vol conditions? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I think a lot of it comes down to... I mean, dealer positioning has been so tight lately. I think all the zero day stuff has allowed them to to kind of keep everything even tighter than usual. Plus, we've like, I mean, there's a lot going on, but we've awkwardly not having had any exogenous shocks to kind of bring it back up and start all the feedback loops. Um, I mean, vol control alone has been they've been able to mostly be buyers all year. So I, I think when you get that exogenous shock that forces them to start selling that will force vol higher which will force them to sell more and you get that that opposite feedback loop but until that happens where you know something huge comes out of policy or some just exogenous shock it it's just difficult for us to get a run up into the 30s 
All right. Well, listen, let's uh, talk some of the charts that you wanted to uh, highlight. And uh, first are a couple of the uh, futures charts on some of these different uh, commodities. And the first one I want to bring up here is uh, cotton. And uh, the cotton chart uh, has uh, just been quite strong all year. It's It's been edging higher. What are you thinking? Yeah, so this is one of my favorite trades at the moment. Uh I mean, mostly based on the fact that it was shockingly hot and dry in Texas, which is where in the U.S. we have our biggest crop. Um, but but there's also been some some issues in in India and China with production. Now Brazil has been there; they've had kind of a perfect crop. So that's 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 honestly, in my opinion, the only thing holding us down here. But you can see that kind of 85 area was a big deal, and we got above it, retested it. Now we're kind of moving higher. So I I think this is still something they can to, can move a lot higher. Um, I think as time progresses, the Texas crop is going to show itself to be even worse than is currently expected. And the last year was a really bad crop. And then this year, when it comes to the the progress, it's even worse. So yeah, last uh, year we had, last year we had that spike up to like 95 to 98 on the upside. Is that a, a reasonable target for what you're looking at? Yeah. To me that, that it, it, it's very possible for us to go hit a new high. I think demand is what's really holding us back. Um, and, and that does worry me, obviously, my macro views aren't exactly bullish. So I, that the demand side worries me a little bit and, and not to mention the dollar, like no one really wants to buy American cotton. If the dollar's just ripping, if they can get it from somewhere else, but in general, just based on the weather side of this and the technicals, I, I still like it a lot. All right. Well, uh, one of the other charts that you uh, highlighted was uh, sugar. Uh, and I'm assuming you're long here. What's uh, what's going on? Yeah, it's same, pretty much the same thing, but this one is really about India. Uh, India produces a lot of sugar and they've had a really brutal, uh, monsoon without much rain. You're talking like kind of like a 100 year drought type situation for them. So their sugar crop is, is struggling. They're going to probably, you know, dramatically limit exports. Uh, so that's kind of the catalyst here. And then obviously just looking at the chart, the break above that, like kind of 26 area was a really big deal, uh, as you're showing it here. So we're making a, a new high just just here today. So, um, so uh, are bullish. you essentially going to be just trend following this up? Uh, and uh, like, what when you are in a trade like this, what uh, is are you looking for for an exit? Uh, obviously, I, in my opinion, when I look at this chart, this is, looks like something that could head to thirty plus on the upside. But when when do you cho- make the choice to to pull the plug on a move like this? Yeah. So. Typically for me, first of all, I'm a core position trading around it. So very like a, a very much a dimmer switch and not a light switch situation. So trimming on the way up and then adding back on the way down, but always having a, a trailing stop. That's like a, a no kidding, like it, below here, I just went out. Um, so the beauty is whenever you get it right early, you can bring that trailing stop with you, keep it wide uh, and then, you know, buy weakness and, and sell some strength along the way. So that that's kind of, that's the the objective here as well. Now you, we haven't really made a move yet, so I don't, I'm not interested in too much trimming yet. But you know, we have a four percent blast off from here or something. Then, then it's time for to start putting some in your pocket and hope to buy it back lower. Well, you know, it's a beautiful looking chart, so let's see if it keeps going. Uh, but you know, the one that you highlighted that doesn't look anything like uh, sugar or cotton is is copper, and uh, and, and now this has spent the entire year just looking like shit. Uh, like uh, every rally's failing. It just uh, it can't get off of the mat. And it looks like it's rolling over at a key support line. Uh, are you, what's your thinking here on copper? Yeah, I'm bearish. So, <laughs> uh, but I will say though, I, to me, we've kind of been stuck in this sort of triangle for a couple of years. And whether you're a bull or a bear, it's kind of been a frustrating, just malaise. Uh, at the end of the day, like obviously I'm a long-term bull of copper. We don't have enough of it. That's pretty clear, especially for all the energy transition stuff that we have planned and EVs and everything like that. But at the same time, a lot of that's more of a, a three plus year story to me where I look at the next year. And if you're not building a lot of homes in China and you're not and you're probably not going to anytime soon, you know, that's that's about a fifth of global demand. So when a fifth of global yeah. demand is is significantly weakened, you have a problem. And then obviously just basic global growth. Uh, having, you know, no, not being great right now, having the dollar run higher, going to make that worse. To me, all that suggests you could have finally have kind of a washout move lower in copper. So 
I'm on the watch out. I'm on the lookout for that. I'm, I'm not short yet. I took one little probing short a week or two ago. It didn't work out. So I'm, I'm waiting, but, but looking to get short. Right. I mean, it is a, such a weak looking chart. Uh, to me, I think the economic cycle is uh, is really playing out. I mean, this is not just a U.S. Uh, growth story and a slowdown. It's actually a global, a synchronized global slowdown driven by global central banks tightening credit conditions and slowing the economy. It's not an environment where, you know, demand for copper should be ripping. Uh, exactly. With that said, uh, you know, it, it's it probably down the road is going to be an epic buying opportunity. So uh, short term, short, and uh, then looking for where that long term buy probably is a good way to set it up, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's move on to some of the different securities. I wanted to uh, uh, to talk to you about this as well, which is this cannabis ETF, MSOS. Now, what's crazy is this ETF was the hottest thing. Uh, 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 how many years back? Am I, I'm going to not even try Four to guess. Three, I can't yeah, two, yeah, it was like, yeah, it, it had that huge rip in 2021. And uh, it's been bloody. I mean, a 90 plus percent wipeout from top to bottom. It's been left for dead. The story, nobody wants to talk about it. And here we have this huge reversal. Uh, a, do you know what uh, caused that reversal? And how does your opinion change on this? Yeah, I do. So first and foremost, it's very important that I disclose the fact that I'm a bag holder here. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you, you just showed that that epic run higher, which I was not involved in that. And I thought it was dumb. And it was a bubble. But after it pulled back about 50, 60 percent, I got interested and got in. And it, that was a, that was many percentages, percentage points ago that we were down like 60 percent. So I'm definitely bag holding here. But at the same time, I, I wrote a piece about it. I don't know, man, like whatever that was a year ago, two years ago. And I, I even said in that piece, look, I hope this doesn't work short term. I hope I hope we don't get any legislative changes here, so that the companies that are in, you know kind of in this uh, index can kind of further build out their moats and entrench. Because at the end of the day, it's just a policy story. Like the reason we, we're up right now is because there was kind of some some happy talk out of the Biden administration about descheduling uh, cannabis, so taking it from Schedule One to Three, which opens up all kinds of possibilities. Plus, in Congress right now, the there it looks likely for like the the fifth time that they might actually do the Safe Banking Act, which will allow these companies to use banks the same way everyone else does. Um, and and when it comes to the the scheduling side of it, uh, they the effective tax rates these companies pay is like over fifty percent. So like because you're doing something that's technically federally illegal, they can't do any write offs or anything like that. So their tax rates are crazy. Uh, and obviously, they're not listed on major exchanges. The big brokerage houses try to, or big, you know, uh, in, investment banks stay away from all the business with them. So if they do get the descheduling, that really opens up not only demand but a lot of structural impediments. So it could be a big, big story from that point. Uh, are you are you how are you looking at this technically obviously in just uh, a, a few days this thing breaks through its entire 2023 trade range uh so clearly that it's an advertisement that it's being bold uh but the the question here is is that i mean it's pretty much has gone a hundred percent in two weeks uh the question is is that is this thing uh, more of a buy on dip or do you think yeah. that this momentum can uh continue here no, my my guess is now that they've re-rated higher, a lot of these players would like look, view this as a great opportunity to go raise some equity, right? So, my assumption is one one of two things: the policy doesn't come through, which has happened many times now. If you actually look at the chart, every p big pop higher was because of getting people getting their hopes up about policy, and then it fell through. So that could happen again, obviously. Um, but this one seems a little bit more serious, I will say. But my assumption is maybe we get up to like 10, 11, 12, something like that. Uh, it starts to look like, oh, no, this really will happen. It goes higher. Then the companies come in and they sell a bunch of equity. And we can come back to like 7, 8, something like that. Uh, that that's kind of where I think filling yourself up in that 7 area would be the ideal scenario. We basically based for 9, 10 yeah. months. If you come back to retest the top of that base, that's that's the ideal situation. That's also where the fib zones are for a retracement. So it's like a ideal kind of pullback to uh, where you can get some asymmetry in the trade. Exactly. All right. 
Let's uh, let's move on. And I'll, I'm so glad you brought this up, uh, this chart on this home builders, because, uh, you know, I had Tony Greer come on and he was so right. He's been long these home builders for a while. So kudos to him. But I can never wrap my head around it. Obviously, there's this dynamic of all these fixed rate mortgages and people stuck in the secondary market uh, being a, uh, much uh, harder to move real estate. So everyone pushing toward new homes. But uh, what a run this has had. We, I mean, we're at 23 year highs on mortgage rates and uh, and these home builders uh, were on fire. Uh, and uh, but now, uh, you know, was that a double top? Like, what are you thinking here? Is this the run out of seam or you think it's still another buy? No, I think it's downside from here. Uh, and I think I think the chart's starting to break down, as you can see. Uh, but that, and that's why I wanted to talk about it was that it's finally to me starting to break down and we're starting to make some kind of lower lows here. And I do think it was largely a double top. We still have some support around 76, but when, if that gives away, like to me, it's lights out and you're right. Like the high rates thing, it kind of tricked everyone. Turns out that was great for home builders. But what I've noticed is no one thinks, no one thinks lower rates will be bad for home builders. I think everyone just thinks home builders win both ways now. And, and I don't think that's the way it's going to work. I think yeah. lower, lower rates will bring a bunch of existing supply on. So then all of a sudden, I mean, if you're, if you're a business, the best thing that can happen to you is to not have competition. And they had, you know, a year to run where they didn't have competition. And that's, that's wonderful for your business and lumber, you know, lumber prices collapsing, things like that were a big help. But now you're going to shift into a situation where, you know, if the economy deteriorates the way, I, at least I think it can, then you will have rates at least go back down some enough to free up some existing supply. Not to mention if you lose your job, the golden handcuffs come off because you just have to sell your house. Um, so just any existing supply bump is going to be new competition, which is going to hurt the, the builders, I think. Yeah. Well, in, in my mind, uh, there's cyclical stocks and there's defensive stocks. And this idea that uh, home builders are resilient in both uh, stages of the cycle is nonsense. And so uh, to me, this is cyclical, no different than the airline stocks were on fire until oil popped. And then suddenly they're right back down to their lows, right? I think that it's just a matter of time before the cyclicality in this space uh, uh, has this deeply mean revert the other way. It'll be interesting to see if the top is in. All right. Now let's talk about the asset that Kevin never wants to name, <laughs> Bitcoin. Let's uh, let's see how many listeners we piss off here. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, has been in a more or less a trade range for uh, for better part of six months. I mean, bounces down to twenty five thousand, heads up to thirty thousand, and just is grinding. Uh, well, how do you how do you interpret what's going on here in the crypto space? Yeah, I mean, it's, it really has been boring. Like you've had you've had a lot of these super low volatility periods where it's gone sideways, and I. But it, the fact that we broke out of the most recent sideways range higher a couple times now, uh, and if you if you draw like a downtrend line from that little spike up in July down, uh, we're kind of testing it right now. So I'm kind of just watching for that. Like I think if you can break above that and then break above the the little pop higher we had uh, last month or a couple weeks ago, I, I think we might see some upside. I think any liquidity proxy, whether it be precious metals, uh, Bitcoin, any, any, any of this stuff, I think we're, you have to be on watch for it to do well. Uh, now, what it's going to really take is something financial to break or you know jobs to have like a big negative print, something like that to get the Fed to like actually take notice of the fact that the soft landing fairy tales ending uh, but whenever that kind of moment, collect, that collective moment happens, that's when these liquidity proxies um, and Bitcoin will lead the way. I think can can start to move up. So I'm I'm just I'm not I'm not buying here, but I'm I'm on watch for it to break higher yeah. be, for because of all those views. Well, you know what? Uh, if you're watching for it to break higher is one thing, but for me, uh, I I look at it the opposite. Right now, it's up to the bulls to prove that uh, they got any gas in the tank. Uh, any rally uh, to me that approaches twenty eight, twenty nine thousand that uh, that fails uh, opens the window for this thing to drop back down to lows where it was earlier in the year. And uh, and so this is a, in my opinion, this rally is a make it or break it moment. And uh, if the bulls don't show up, uh, it, uh, it I basically would have some pretty tight stops on on yeah, pressing 100%. the upside. 
uh, on that front. All right. Uh, the last chart you wanted to talk about, which is a, a really interesting topic, is you uh, wanted to look at the uh, utilities, but instead of looking at them as um, in their typical ETF form, you wanted to put it uh, uh, over the S&P just to show the relative underperformance that this has had. Uh, what are you thinking here on the utilities? Yeah, so this, if you go back, I mean, obviously, it's, it's, the, so it's the worst performing sector in the S&P this year. Uh, it's been brutal. But... If you go back the kind of the last two, three weeks, all of a sudden it's really perking itself up. I, I just noticed on my screen, I look at each uh, each sector every day and not this past week, but the week before, the Thursday and Friday were really strong. And then it, it held through last week uh, and so far this week, decent. So if you, if you make that into a weekly instead of a daily, it kind of shows itself in a way a little bit better. Um, but all, like all of a sudden, it kind of put in a, a pretty big low and spiked higher. Sentiment is completely horrible for it positioning. Like no, no one, no one wants this. Everyone thinks we're still in this kind of cyclical upswing, reacceleration, soft landing. So none of that is where you would expect you know defensives to start performing. And obviously, they have a lot of work left. It's not like they've done anything yet. But I just think it's notable that. For two weeks running, we've had pretty significant upside. That's all. You know, it's interesting. Um, so you can, I'll tell you my little scenario and you tell, push back on it if you think it's something different, but uh, whether you you can lump the utilities in with uh, many healthcare, with a lot of the telecoms, particularly like the AT&T and Verizons of the world, like anything with a high dividend has been trading like a bond proxy and it's been getting slammed with bonds on the downside and nobody's been touching them. But if we're seeing topping formations developing uh, there's obviously many asset managers that can't go to cash so that wrote sector rotation into uh, low beta more defensive high dividend paying sectors may be the trade do you think uh, that this is just a, a a reflection on the fact that maybe we're going to see sector rotation in a defensive way and that these types of stocks will start getting some love that's exactly what i think um and going back to the dollar hurting tech more than anything else, like tech is really starting to roll over. So even the funny thing is, if you charted uh, the utilities or, or any other defensive, but especially utilities, because they've been kind of the hotter one against tech instead of just the, the market itself, it's even more impressive. So I think as the dollar weighs on the the kind of the market leader, uh, the top, you know, call it 10 stocks, whatever, uh, it, it should start to really see some movement. Uh, and you're right. So what's interesting to me is it's been, everyone just looks at it as a, just a pure bond, bond proxy and it usually is. But it's not like rates have moved down much in the last two and a half weeks and yet utilities are outperforming by you know whatever it is like six percent or something in the last two and a half weeks so we'll we'll be really interesting to see if the trend continues there uh okay we have only a few more minutes i'm going to lightning around you a couple of things crude oil uh, i mean this has been a, a a roaring market uh what's your, what's your thinking here in terms of where we're going yeah i mean we're on a stick so a pullback would to like 86 on wti would make perfect sense but for now i mean I, I'm, I'm super bullish the supply and demand is just too good all right. Well, let's talk uranium. I'm going to just put up because uh, there's a cleaner chart on the um, the uh, the Sprott physical, but the U308 contract at 66. We basically uh, on uranium hit uh, multi-year highs. Uh, it's been on fire. What are you thinking here on uranium? Yeah, it's it's my favorite investment. It has been since 2016. It's it's the biggest weighting um, I have. I'm a little nervous just because we've gone straight up, and I, I've noticed. Uh, so for one thing, our, our buddy Cuppy today retweeted some guy yeah. saying he had his his entire retirement savings in it, and it's like, well, that's that's the kind of tweets that make me nervous and make me want to take a little off the table. But at the same time, uh, at least in my personal account, like I I've just promised myself since 2016, I'm not selling anything. I'm only buying until until physical uranium hits 100 dollars a pound. So that that's that's the goal there. But can we pull back? You know, absolutely. We've gone straight up. It makes sense. Yeah. The the one thing about uranium that is is that 
when you think about nuclear energy, it's such a huge topic, a political topic. It's something that could capture, you know, the, the imaginations of investors. But when you look at the size of the uranium market, I mean, if everyone wanted to put some skin in the game, there isn't enough to go around. And this is what actually could make it very bubblish, all right? Like, because, I mean, Kathy Wood bought some Cameco, you know, I, was it uh, uh, Druckenmiller also bought some? Like, uh, you're starting to get people that are not commodity investors poking around here. And, and this is the big question is, is like, can this just uh, be something that, that just uh, goes crazy because it's simply there isn't enough, uh, you know, stock to go around. And if everyone wants exposure, they're going to have to just buy at any price. Exactly. And, and you've actually seen this with, I think it was Paladin, um, a couple other companies where I've seen some block trades where it's just someone snapping up 1% of the company in a block trade. So, you, you, so like I work at uh, Bulwark Capital, we're we're you know not a huge RIA, um, but we have about, actively managed about four hundred million. And even for us, I mean we're not we're not some giant hedge fund, but even for us, like I can buy you know URNM without like getting a bunch of slippage. Obviously, I can buy Cam or a Cameco, but you get past you know a, one of the big indexes and you get past Cameco, and it gets tough to buy anything without moving it around. So if you're managing billions yeah. you really can't do it other than well just go buy the index or go buy cameco and even then you probably got to keep it small so yeah you yeah. could have a situation where everyone wants in uh even druck has bought some uh some cameco like a lot of people are starting to pile in um yeah it's it's a lot of a lot of people trying to get through a small exit on the way in and out well, listen, uh, Chase, we're uh, running short on time here, but I wanted to thank you so much. Uh, you know, I want to bring you on on a regular basis because I love talking charts with you, bud. So thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, and uh, thanks for your opinions, buddy. Yeah, of course. Always. Thank you. Thanks again for tuning in to the Market Huddle Plus. We appreciate you spending the time with us. And listen, you can never have too many friends, bull market or bear market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. Cheers, everyone.